Hey friends, this weekend I watched a Netflix documentary, The Secrets of Hillsong, about the evangelical Pentecostal church that was founded in Australia. It was immensely popular for a time. Justin Bieber was a follower. They were influential in promoting a youth message for a conservative denomination of old fogies, the Assemblies of God. One of the reasons an awful lot of churches now have pop rock bands in front of the congregation is Hillsong. It was a powerful tool for drawing in attendees and was the rock upon which many megachurches were built. It grew from a regional Pentecostal church under Frank Houston into an international network of megachurches under his son, Brian Houston. The documentary begins with the story of Carl Lentz, a dynamic, charismatic preacher who trained at Hillsong, who led the first church in the United States in New York. While the new church grew phenomenally, it was also the beginning of the end. While it was a popular church among black communities, for instance, it was noticed that very few black people had prominent roles. It was the usual story. White leaders spoke a good game, talking up the importance of diversity while not following through. The end of Lentz, though, was the discovery that he was burying stories of abuse in the church and was cheating on his wife. Brian Houston denounced him and Lentz was dismissed. Then it was revealed that Brian Houston had also been engaged in inappropriate behavior. It's hypocrisy all the way through. Brian Houston eventually resigned as evidence of two affairs was revealed and then even worse his father, Frank, had been abusing children for at least 30 years. And Brian had known about it and covered it up. Frank was dead by then, so I guess he got away with it. It's the layers and layers and layers of duplicity that were gradually unfolded that made the documentary interesting. The Christian characters were shown denying the accusations repeatedly and then eventually admitted their truth. I was having sex with that woman. Or, and yeah, Dad was a pedo. The church has since imploded and splintered, with various branches cutting all ties and attendance shrinking rapidly. It's still around, but its influence is vastly diminished. It's becoming a familiar story with the similar collapse of Mars Hill, the Seattle-based megachurch, in that case, it was the arrogance and bullying of the lead pastor, Mark Driscoll, that led to the catastrophic collapse. I learned a few lessons. Number one, authoritarian leadership is bad. Humans are humans, and when given unconstrained power within an organization, they will abuse it. Two, Noble goals, even when I disagree with them, like the idea of bringing people to Christ, are never enough. You need rules and discipline for everyone. It's when you get a select few thinking they are above the rules that you get disaster. Three, transparency is essential. The unsavory secrets will eventually burn their way through whatever you've hidden them behind, and then there will be a reckoning. And four, everyone is an unreliable narrator when it comes to telling their own story. Cross-check everything. This is not all I want to say, though. You know, I already detest religion, especially Christianity, and especially evangelical Christianity. You could argue that what I'm saying here is also an example of an unreliable narrator uh, and ask, can you really trust my opinion when it comes to religion? You know I've got biases. But then, right after I finished the Hillsong documentary, someone sent me a link to an article defending Jeff Marcy. It sounded very much like the apologetics offered by the perpetrators of the Hillsong debacle, but it has nothing at all to do with religion. It has to do with academia. Okay, so the article was a bit odd. Uh, it comes out of the blue eight years after the Marcy affair was closed. The story is that Marcy was a prominent astronomer at Berkeley who was famed for his research on exoplanets. 
No one has questioned his research. It was great stuff with many collaborators. But he was handsy with the women. Multiple women came forward with stories of Marcy being inappropriately personal with him. So, said one, He's had a long history of behaving inappropriately, especially with undergraduates, said Kirkpatrick, who at the time was a graduate student at Berkeley studying astrophysics. Women discouraged other women from working with him as a research advisor. It was just something that was talked about pretty frankly among the women in the department. Kirkpatrick, who has since left academia, continues to run the Women in Astronomy blog, through which she says three other women have approached her with accounts of their experiences with Marcy. This is so familiar. The Whisper Network had identified him long before. Notice also that some women left the field because of his behavior. Now, said another, one of the women, known as Complainant 3, studied astronomy as a graduate student. She spoke on the condition of anonymity because she did not want her involvement in this matter to affect her, her current job. According to her account to Berkeley's Office for the Prevention of Harassment and Discrimination, she was at a post-colloquium dinner with her graduate department at the University of Hawaii when Marcy placed his hand on her leg, slid his hand up her thigh, and grabbed her crotch. She didn't register an official complaint until eight years later, by which time she had left astronomy. In part, she said, because of the sexual harassment she and other female astronomers experienced. When you're a student and you see every complaint being ignored, and every professor who has violated that have zero consequences, it really makes you not want to step forward, she said. Marcy abused his influence to shield himself from the consequences and he was protected by other senior scientists. What's really infuriating about this is that anybody of my generation in the field of exoplanets knows that Jeff does this, Johnson said. Everybody is so afraid of doing anything about it that they're afraid of speaking up, but everybody knows it. After investigations confirmed the problems with Marcy's behavior, he eventually resigned. He was expelled from the National Academy of Science. He still publishes paper and still raises controversy. The latest is that he was co-author on a paper that excluded credit to the graduate students who did much of the work. So here's this paper on which he is third author. It's been withdrawn, temporarily. Notice the comment at the end from the lead author. It has come to my attention that there are significant concerns about the author list of this manuscript. It is very important to me that I honor everyone's contribution to this work appropriately. Accordingly, I am revisiting the author list with the goal of setting a standard for authorship that fairly acknowledges everyone's contributions. So, it's an authorship dispute. The grad students felt unfairly overlooked, so the author list is being reviewed. Seems reasonable. However, this has sparked unwarranted anger on the right. Here's the headline of the complaint. Campus Puritans come for an astronomer and his byline. By demanding that morality tests be imposed on scientific journal authorship, Jeff Marcy's critics are creating a dangerous precedent. So, let me put this in context, though. This article was published in Quillette, the online journal that specializes in publishing slanted articles from aggrieved conservatives, race pseudoscientists, and people who are outraged at the existence of gay and trans people. The joke is that if you want to publish your positive views on craniometry and phrenology, it will be loved on Quillette. It is not a reputable site, quite the opposite actually. The choice of venue instantly calls into question the content of the article. Also, note the author, Lawrence Krauss. Krauss faced his own scandals accused of behaviors that range from 
offensive comments to groping and non-consensual sexual advances. He was notorious for defending Jeffrey Epstein, a precedent that ought to make Jeffrey Marcy uneasy about being defended by him. His position, at the, Krauss's position as uh, the head of the Origins Project at Arizona State University was not renewed because ASU agreed that the preponderance of evidence showed he, that he had violated their pro policies against sexual harassment. However, he didn't get fired from his job. Instead, he waited a year and quietly resigned. So basically what we've got here is a harasser trying to defend a har another harasser on the pages of a disreputable journal. Yeah, I think we can just dismiss this one out of hand. I will comment on one thing though. This idea of demanding morality tests on authorship. From what I've read, that isn't a question here. Some graduate students aren't happy that their names are left off the paper while the notorious harasser was left on. Uh, it's a complicated question of what we're going to value here. But also, why shouldn't we consider moral values in this sort of thing? Why should known offenders be allowed to gather fame and reputation from scientific research, especially when it's at the expense of students? Both Marcy and Krauss have been cast aside by the scientific community as unworthy contributors. So what advantage is there to welcoming, welcoming them to the pages of our journals? Another point that their co-authors might want to bring up, they're being asked to share a byline with someone who is a known predator. They have a right to object to the association. And it is right and necessary that people who abuse the system should not be allowed to profit from it. Which brings us back to Hillsong. They too built a hierarchy with flawed people at the top. They wanted to hide away the abuse. They tried to silence critics. They considered their authorities too important to question. And look where it got them. It led to them being so thoroughly discredited that their organization crumbled beneath them. Near the end of the Hillsong documentary, they talked with some of the featured workers from the group, and it was impressive how well they had been alienated. Some were still religious, but had switched denominations. Some of them rebuked the megachurch experience and had found belonging in, the small, in small community churches. And some had lost their faith altogether. One even declared that he was now a happy atheist. Science, at least, is not relying on a single hierarchical authority, so it's not going to collapse as suddenly as a church could. Still, though, keep in mind that Jeffrey Marcy was driving women out of astronomy. This is an incalculable loss. I don't care how great Marcy's research was. That information is still there. But we cannot continue to prop up researchers who are harming the discipline as a whole. Exoplanet science is not dependent on any one person and will continue to progress, probably even at a faster rate as the selfish disruptors are weeded out. None of this is about Puritans or even pathetic posturing little wimps. It's not even about sex at all. It's about checking an abuse of power. If you're concerned about the detriment to science that losing Jeff Marcy has had, think about this. What if, early in his career, one of his peers had taken Marcy aside and explained to him that his behavior was troubling, that people see what he's doing, and he should stop it? Maybe then he wouldn't have gone on to damage himself and the careers of the women he worked with. He wouldn't have lost his job, and we'd all be in a better place. As long as there are people like Dawkins and Krauss who make excuses for predators and accuse anyone who protests abuses of power, though, the problem will persist and grow. And I'm sure we can all think of other examples of this unfortunately human phenomenon. Wait, wait, wait! Breaking news! I, w I was just finishing up this video and I 
was waiting for it to process and I made the mistake of reading Nature magazine and Nature has just come out with an interesting and relevant article. It's called The Mental Health Crisis in Science. It says with research researchers reporting high rates of anxiety and depression, calls are growing to change toxic ele elements of the culture in science. Oh, really? We're not just saying they're all a bunch of wimps? Okay. Uh, anyway, it's pointing out that there's there's serious problems with science culture. Uh, it's not very conducive to the mental health of the individuals that participate in it. And for instance, it points out uh, graduate students report anxiety and depression at rates six times that of the general population. Wow. And uh, women have it worse than men. And you're not going to be surprised at this. Transgender individuals have it even worse. So um, it says, in a worldwide survey of more than 13,000 researchers, they felt overwhelmed by their situation at work very often or fairly often during the previous month. So this is what we're dealing with. And yet we've got people like Krauss and Dawkins dismissing their concerns and just telling them to uh, man up, you know, the usual old white man's litany of how to fix everything. So anyway, I'm just throwing this in at the last minute. Now I will finish up this video and get it out of here.